<laughs> this is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new value, and a new experience. Welcome to the D-Spot Podcast. I'm your guide, Katie Silcox, bringing you your weekly self-love sound bites. Join us for conversations around sex, spirit, and all things self-care. All things self-care. This is a journey into sound. 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 Hey, everybody. We've got a really fun podcast recording for you guys this week. I wanted to just give you the heads up that it was recorded live. This past July 2018 in Asheville, North Carolina at the beautiful, wonderful Asheville Yoga Festival. It was a workshop entitled Ayurveda 101 and it turned into a deep discussion on your metabolism, your Agni, your detox mechanisms in the body and your sexual youth sap and vitality, your Agni, Ama, and Ojas, as we call it in Ayurveda. And so um, check it out. I want to apologize ahead of time for the sound quality. It was recorded on my phone, but I really love it. And I think it's a fun talk and I think it's practical and I get fiery and feisty and silly and talk about the goddess as Beyonce herself. (laughs) So I really wanted to include it for you guys. So I hope you enjoy and we'll see you soon. A few people coming in a little bit tardy in the sense that this room is a little bit hidden, which is kind of nice because we're talking about secret stuff. So let's just sit together for a moment and we'll tune in. And as we begin to explore and enter into a deeper relationship with the teachings of yoga and Ayurveda, one of the most important things that we can do is remember that these are These are both borrowed teachings from a beautiful and ancient lineage in India. And so we take a moment to honor the fact that these teachings are very much, we we are guests in the room with the tradition of yoga and Ayurveda. And we just honor and hold gratitude for being able to receive this wisdom that has been maintained. Many of us come from a culture where our wisdom traditions were destroyed or devalued. And so we just offer up our heart to thank this beautiful tradition from India as we begin to explore Ayurveda today. And we also honor and hold the fact that we, as practitioners of yoga or any spiritual discipline, it's imperative that we make these teachings real and authentic for our own heart and in our own words. And that we know that underneath all these principles that we'll learn today and everything we've learned this weekend that has any value or any truth to it, that all of these teachings are boundaryless. These teachings know no race, no creed, no culture. These teachings are the natural outflowing of every human body and all of nature itself. And so as we bow before the lineage teachings, we also remember that it is our birthright to know these laws and principles of nature. These principles live in our DNA just as our grandmothers and her grandmother and her grandmother and grandfathers and his grandfather, all that lineage that we hold in our bones continue to teach us. 
And so as we sit together this morning and come together, if there is a prayer in your heart, you could say a sankalpa, an intention, a desire. There is desire in this room in every beating heart. What is my deepest desire? Why am I here in Asheville? Why am I in this room? What do I long for? Chant one ohm to seal this prayer. Oh, Om Tatpurashaya Vidmahe. Vakratunda yati mahi Tanodanti prachodayat Om Shanti 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 And when you're ready, you can slowly begin to come back and open your eyes. So good morning and welcome to this talk on Ayurveda 101 with Katie Silcox. I hope you're in the right room and you're not expecting the hot vinyasa flow hour. (laughs) Hopefully by this point you've had enough of that and enough downward dogs. And so you'll be ready to receive this morning's break. And hopefully it'll be just a really juicy experience where you leave a little bit more inspired to know more about Ayurveda and know more about how you can support your own wellness. Um, The way that I've kind of crafted this morning's class, I'll give you a little overview of what we're going to do and so you'll feel safe with the morning and um, what we'll do is basically I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about my own journey and how I got into Ayurveda. Come on in. And um, then we'll come into the nuts and bolts of Ayurveda and the basics because this is an Ayurveda 101 class. And then um, what I really want to do is have us experience some Ayurveda. So it'll be a little bit theoretical and then a little bit practical and experiential so that you can leave here um, embodying a little bit of these teachings, not only just intellectualizing them. So um, I came to Ayurveda because I fell in love, as many of you uh, have probably done, with yoga. And um, I'm 38 next week. Yay, Leo! (laughs) You're like, what a shock. Um, And I started yoga when I was 19. And I lived in Spain, and I had this wild Ashtanga yoga teacher. And I would go to his little studio that was probably like a fourth of the size of this room. And... Um, we would do two and a half hours of Ashtanga yoga every night. Yeah, I was, I was young and never done yoga and never really been in my body before. I was raised Southern Baptist. I'm from Tennessee, Virginia area. And um, when I found yoga, it was just like, oh my gosh, I'm home. Like this, this, is, this is home for me. And so I began practicing yoga. Uh, to say religiously and fervently would be an understatement. I became uh, a little bit obsessed with it and did it every day religiously. Um, And then over time, to keep the story short, what I found was that 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 yoga still wasn't addressing my issues. My issues may be similar to your issues. Your issues may be different. But the uh, fact is that many of us, I would say almost all of us, come to yoga because we've got something else going on that doesn't feel good. And so for me, it was digestive stuff, anxiety, super bad anxiety, like really rough journey on that realm. 
And initially, yoga really helped, really helped. Um, but what I found that was that over time, it wasn't enough. And so I, I moved to India and decided to go straight to the source. Um, and, and that was a f funny idea in my young girl's brain because I thought, I'll go to India because in India, everything will be easier. I'll, I'll heal my digestive issues. <laughs> and uh, it will, uh, all my anxiety will go away in India. And some of you are laughing, which I'm sure means you've been there. And so India is basically where to go if you want all your issues to multiply. Um, and so I, I traveled all over India. And, well, I'll get to that. Yeah, you'll have to go. <laughs> well, the short version is that India, India is a very stressful place. And, you know, it's a beautiful place as well. But in India, the, the teachings of yoga say that if you want to practice yoga, you need certain things to be in place. And those certain things are clean water, clean air, and no people. <laughs> and so India is essentially the exact opposite of that. So um, I, I was lucky enough to meet a beautiful teacher in the south of India that I lived with for a year, uh, a month. It felt like a year. Um, and his name was A.G. Mohan and his wife, Indra Mohan. And I lived in their home and they taught me a different form of yoga than the one that I had been practicing. It was a much more mellow, uh, restorative, healing form of yoga. And more importantly to this morning's talk, they taught me Ayurveda. And so um, Ayurveda was the thing that really began to shift the more deeply seated health issues that I had. Um, and so really that's why I wrote this book. I wrote a book called Healthy, Happy, Sexy, Ayurveda uh, Wisdom for Modern Women. It's 99% of the book is for men as well. And it really set me on my course. But I wanted to share just a little bit of my personal journey because I think at a yoga festival, it's really important to remember the things that we're doing in the United States that we call yoga is not what most Indian people are doing. And it's certainly not going to solve all of our issues. And if you've been doing yoga for a while, you know this. And so Ayurveda was the thing that really started to help me get to the root of the root of where these issues were, were, were originating from. So you can think of Ayurveda as the sister of yoga, and you can think of Ayurveda as the, the mother, if you will, of yoga. Yoga may be the father. Ayurveda is the mother. It is the feminine. Why is it the mother? Why is it the feminine? Ayurveda is the thing that is going to nurture us. It's the thing that's going to sustain us. I said yesterday, uh, or the day before, I don't know when it was, in class, uh, the feminine is the one who changes your dirty diapers, right? Dads, dads, are, dads have the feminine too, but like, mama's the one that's there, changing the dirty diapers and, and nourishing us, right, through her breast. This really is Ayurveda. And so if we're only doing yoga, in other words, if we're only doing our spiritual practice, if we're only moving our bodies, if we're only doing this one side, we're really missing out on the mama. The mama's the one that's gonna hold us, love us, pour ghee on us, squirt rose petals into our mouth, and you know, give us a good colon cleanse when we need it. Um, and so I became really passionate about Ayurveda, as you guys can see, and I want to share a little bit about it with you this morning. Before we do that, I'm just curious, how many of you, maybe raise your hand if you feel like you're a total novice to Ayurveda, it's new to you, totally new to you, okay? And then how many of you feel, I know, I know a little bit about it, I know about the doshas, I'm curious. How many of you feel like I'm an expert on Ayurveda and I probably know more than you, Katie? Raise your arm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll let you teach and I'll just drink this tea. Um, cool, so that gives me an idea of where we are. So um, let's, let's, let's sort of start at the beginning. Um, so in the beginning, there was pure emptiness, pure consciousness. The teachings call this force Shiva. Another definition of Shiva is that which brings great auspiciousness to your life. Another definition of Shiva is the one who eternally witnesses. 
Shiva is sitting here in this room with us right now through the gateway of your eyeballs and mine. It's the part of you that can witness you and not freak out <laughs> and not think thoughts and not lay judgment on yourself and not label things. I like her, I don't like her. That was a good experience, that totally sucked. I never want that to happen again, right? Shiva is this part of us that was before we were born with us, that will be with us all throughout life, and when we pass away in this form, we'll still be around. In the Christian tradition, we might call this God the Father. So if you don't like the God word, you can leave it. Just presence, pure presence. And y'all know what I'm talking about if you're a meditator, or you're not a meditator, but you've had this moment when everything could be a shitstorm in your life, and suddenly there's this part of you that's able to remain firm and steady and get the right answer. So this Shiva thing is, I know when I'm in it, because like this thing is so much nicer to me than I would ever be probably to me. So imagine that in the beginning there was only that. There was no me and no you. There was just that field of awareness, of wakeness. And in the mythology of India, they call it Shiva, and you can look at him, and he's super hot, and like has long hair, and mala beads, and like basically looks like that dude right there. <laughs> and like he's meditating on top of the mountain. And he's a yogi, right? Shiva is the original yogi. And this original yogi, in his meditation, after m maybe millions and millions of years of being this full-on force field of oneness, decides that that's boring. And if you were in my class the first night, we, I spoke about this. What happens when we get bored? And actually, a better way of saying this is, what happens when everything's going really good in your life, you're not on Tinder, you're not dating anybody, you're not really going to decide to change your career, you're not quitting your job, you don't really feel like you need to gain weight or lose weight, you don't have any major health issues, you know what I'm talking about, things are kind of placid, and what do you go and do? <laughs> you go and buy a puppy, right? or you decide, I'm going to start dating someone, or you go and fall in love, or you quit your job and go join the Peace Corps, you, you cut your hair and dye it blonde, etc. Now, I'm not talking about me on any of these things, y'all know that, right? <laughs> so Shiva said, I am all one, I don't have any problems, I don't have any issues, and this is super boring. So what Shiva does is, from this meditation, he starts to experience this new thing. And this new thing is called desire. Shiva decides out of his heart, some, some of the mythology says his heart, some say his third eye, so you can think about it, from his love or from his big idea, he decides to create her Shakti. Now what man in his right mind would decide to create Shakti, who is literally the force of dynamicism that is always changing. So I always tell my male students and my male friends and my brothers, look, you can't complain about women because the thing that drives you crazy about her is the reason that anything is even here. The fact that we have a menstrual cycle means that chemically you are a different woman on day one than day 15 than day 28. You are literally chemically a different person. And so I say to my male friends and my brothers or my lesbian friends that are with a feminine woman who have more testosterone and are like, what the hell? <laughs> the reason that there are even life beings on this planet is because she's changeable. And so out from Shiva's heart comes this wild woman, and she begins to do this. You know what I'm talking about? Do you know why we love Beyonce? <laughs> it's this thing. It's literally that undulation of creation. 
So don't be surprised if your body wants to do this, whether you're a man or a woman, because this is that original dance that Shakti did for him. So imagine you're a dude, you've been meditating alone, happy as a clam for a million years, all of a sudden you have Beyonce herself in front of you, undulating. And Shiva goes, he starts to drool. <laughs> and, the, and the thing that's related to us is, is in that moment, he forgets that he's God. He forgets that he's everything. He becomes intoxicated by her. He becomes intoxicated by the feeling of being different. I'm Shiva, you're Shakti. I'm not like that, I can't dance like that, Beyonce. I, I cannot. And that's why we all fall in love. The falling in love comes from the fact that I'm over here and you're over there, and oh my God, I found you. And you're not me, but you kind of get me but you're not me, and I like that you're not me, don't become me, you. So this cosmic dance starts, and then Shakti's, you know, dancing, and then she goes, oh, you like this? You haven't seen anything yet. And out from her womb, Kama Yoni, the womb of desire, her desire starts to spring forth. And guess what she wants? She wants to show him all of herself. I'm getting chill bumps, and that's really why, and I, I don't mean to make it about men and women, but this dynamicism of the masculine and feminine, that is why we love to, when we feel safe, to dance and reveal ourselves to a man. And that's why as a man, or someone who identifies more with the masculine, it's intoxicating to watch her reveal herself, because that's this original play. And so Shakti just begins to birth things. And she births all of us. And she births the trees. And she births the birds. And she births Donald Trump. And she says, I love you. And you, I love you. <laughs> and Shiva gets to play with this incredible force that has the power to birth everything. The teachings say Shiva is God. But God without Shakti is dead. That's why in my tradition, we Shakta uh, tradition, we worship the goddess because without her, Shiva, the teaching say, cannot even move. So in this great birthing and expression, she uses five elements to create everything. And those elements are written up conveniently on the board for you, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. So everything that this Beyonce Shakti Force, I'm so into that. I, I just created that in my head. This Beyonce Shakti Force um, creates, is comprised of these five elements in differing amounts. You, as you sit here in this room, have an elemental combination that is composed of the exact same thing that makes up me, only you have different amounts and different ratios. And the teachings say that no two entities on the planet, whether it be me or a rock or thought, no two things on the planet have the same elemental makeup. It's crazy, right? You can see it even in like thumbprints. So she uses these five elements, and they go from dense to, to, to subtle. Earth, of course, being the heaviest, most dense, Water less, but denser than fire. Fire den uh, lighter than uh, water, but less than air. Air lighter than space, but of course, uh, uh, denser than space, but lighter than everything else. And then space being this force that is in this room right here, that is the space that fills up the room. And so then these elements had an affinity for one another. They like to join together. They like to play together. And so if you think about it just naturally, you know this intuitively because of your relationship to these elements. These elements are not an Indian thing. This is in all ancient Western and Eastern medical tradition. And so these elements like each other. And if you think about it, earth and water mix really well. Like if you take dirt and you put water in it and you stir it, you get mud or concrete. I mean, we've built these buildings on the premise of the fact that earth and water like each other. 
if you mix earth with wind, nothing happens except just dirt flying through the air. <laughs> Which happens in nature, but it's like we, we're trying to, that's what you say, it's a hurricane, a shitstorm, an accident. <laughs> But naturally, earth and water go together. This may seem counterintuitive, but when we say water, we don't just mean water. We also mean oil. And so fire and oil actually really like each other. And if you've ever built you know, a, a bonfire or tried to start a grill, you need a little bit of lighter fluid. You need a little bit of oil. And in the ancient traditions, you would use ghee or butter to stoke the fire. Even if you look at a candle, if you have one at home, if it's a nice one, it'll have a little bit of oil on it, and that's what keeps that flame burning. So these two elements have an affinity for one another. Unctuousness and heat. That's why if you are a fiery person, which there's a few of you in the room, right? If you're a fiery person, you may notice that you get a little bit of oily skin, right? This kind of quality of oil on the skin is a hallmark of having a fiery composition. Um, and then air and ether have an affinity for one another. It makes sense, right? Air is wind, or another way of saying it is just movement. And so it's much easier for things to move through empty space. If we had something moving through this room, it would go unimpeded. Whereas if this room were a, a pure concrete slab, air really can't move through it. And so it's just, just intuitive, right? And these things come together, and they make this third force. And so what are these forces that these five elements make? These five elements make these three bigger um, forces in the universe that we call the Ayurvedic doshas that you may be familiar with. You may have done an online quiz and become very confused about flying. <laughs> I'm not a fan of them. I wrote a whole book so that when people were like, I took a quiz and I'm really confused, I could just be like, it's really complicated. <laughs> You're really complicated. So every single person in this room is this unique combination of these five forces who make these three doshic forces. And so you were born that way. You were born that way, and you'll die that way. It's just your thumbprint. So we call these vata, pitta, and kapha. Um, yes? I was going to say, because I studied a little bit, um, and there's like your, your physical dosha, and then there's maybe like your constitute, like your, your mental, but then there's also like within the seasons, maybe you, you know, you start off as, as pitta, and then as you get older, and so I, I think, how do you sort of reconcile that there's three different combinations within you? Pause. I'm going to give you the information. Okay. <laughs> it's complicated. It's complicated. Yeah. So it's important just to have the basics, which right. is you were born right. with a particular dosha, we call sure. it a property, that you don't change. Right. And so um, when these forces are out of balance, when these forces are... Let's say you were born with a certain amount of fire. <clears throat> Let's say you are primarily a fire type. You may get a job in your 30s or 50s, let's say, where you have to actually travel a lot. And, or you go through a traumatic experience, and all of a sudden you may be dealing with different issues that have nothing to do with your dosha. Right. So, but I think, <clears throat> let's continue with this uh, base understanding before we get to the particulars. So when these forces are in, in harmony in the right amounts for you, which will not be whatever it is, 33, 33, these, these things aren't in equal amounts in you. They're in different amounts. When you are in the correct amount for your body that you had when you were born, you will be able to best serve your dharma, meaning your purpose on this planet. So there are people in this room who have more earth and more water, and that's required for their dharma, for their expression. There are people who have more ether in this room, and that's required for their expression. In other words, this idea of especially female bodies all being vata types, meaning long and lanky and skinny, is actually insidious and very harmful. Because it's not just saying you don't look like the pattern that we deem valuable. It's also saying that your dharma is worthless. When the most important people on the planet are holding a lot of earth and water. 
<laughs> in the sense that they're keeping us crazy unicorns grounded as just look at Kathy, right? She has more, she's very fire, but she has that earth and water stability. So when these things are functioning in you the way they need to function, it is easier for you to feel that you are in alignment with your purpose, which is important. When these things get out of balance, and they're out of balance in all of us a little bit or a lot at this time on the planet. When these things get out of balance, we call them doshas. Dosha means a fault, like an imbalance, a fault line, something that's waiting to go out of balance. When they are behaving in a way that brings more life and more health and are in the right amounts for you, they're actually called the subtle doshas. And this is important because you don't hear about this a lot in the Ayurveda world. Dosha, when people say, I'm a pitta, I'm a fire type, I'm a vata, they're actually saying something akin to me saying in English, I'm an inflammation. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, 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 a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, I'm a metabolism. These are, <laughs> Indian people make fun of you when you do this, <laughs> right? Nobody in India ever says, I'm a kapha. What they might say is, in this channel, in the body, there's some kapha, right? And so it's just a little thing to think of, but I think it's important because as Americans, we love to self-identify. I want to know what I am. What am I? What am I? But really, the more important question is, what were the elemental, what was the elemental composition when I was born and how has that shifted and changed to me now? So now is called your Vikruti. V-I-K-R-U-T-I. Kruti means nature, and V means the way that you separated yourself from your original nature. So I, I am more or less almost all smart Ayurveda people that have prodded on me have said, you're mostly fire with a secondary heavy amount of, of air and ether, and then, you know, a little bit of kapha, right? And so some people have even given me percentages around it, whatever. The point is, my nature is fiery, but I struggle, as I've told you guys, during a certain period of my, my life, I struggled with anxiety, which is a vata issue. And so now that I don't struggle with that really as much, all the fire has room to come out. In other words, you guys might be sitting here now with something that's occurring in your life or in your body that's actually sitting on your, your original nature. We call that your vikruti. A really super easy, practical way of thinking about this is your symptoms. You may be the most earthy, grounded mama, sexy goddess, Beyonce on the planet, but you struggle with anxiety. That is not your nature. That is a foreign invader. So thinking about yourself right now in terms of what was I by, what am I by birth, by nature, and now what am I struggling with? If you want to know what you were by nature, it's really easy. You can take these quizzes online, but my book is, I think, pretty good at helping you find what you were when you were born. And uh, the quick and dirty on it is, it's your body. If I look at my body, and I look at my bone structure, I know that I have a more vata body type. Anything that's long, lanky, expansive. If I look at the features of my face, if I look at my long-term tendency since I was young, if I look at my hair, if I look at my eyes, if I look at my skin, those are things that just don't change. Sorry. You know, I would like to have different thick, luscious hair like some of you in the room. That's not going to happen no matter how much product we buy. <laughs> Similarly, those of you in the room, that your bones are never going to change. You're never going to have thin bones. And that's a good thing. And so thinking about what was I, what have I been all my life, and it's really looking at your physical structure where you can see that super easily. Great, that's where I'm gonna get back to. But what am I now? What am I dealing with now? And so I'm not gonna go into a whole, because I have an online school, if you're like, dude, I'm so into this, I have to more. I have an online school that 
lasts a year. It starts this January. Get your booty in it. It's 300 hours. If you're a yoga teacher and you want to like triple your income, do my training because this is really the way I went from a struggling yoga teacher to like a normal human that could pay her mortgage. That's a whole other talk that we should do. How <laughs> yoga people can meet to make more money. But my point is, I have a whole year long program because this shit's complicated. So my intention for today is to diagnose everybody's imbalances and tell everybody what they are. I'm sorry, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> but what we can do is, um, Think about um, the life-giving, health-affirming aspects of the dosha. So, uh, and then how things go off balance. And just in terms of me thinking about how to use this time with you guys the wise, wisest way possible, everybody on the planet in America, especially right now, is dealing with a vata imbalance. So if you're on the internet and you ever get in a car, and uh, you ever read the news, you probably have some vata going on. Vata, vata is the energy of change. It's the extreme forms of it are anxiety and grief, depress depression. And those are two things that people we really struggle with right now. Um, and so if you, if just, just know that most people in your classes, if you're a yoga teacher, and usually us, most of the imbalances on the planet right now are coming in, in Western culture, are coming from Vata issues. Fear and seduction. Grief and fear. And, and in a moment, I'm going to describe a vicious or it can be virtuous cycle that all of us get into. So no matter what your dosha is, what we'll do next is going to be helpful. Um, Agni is written up on the board, Amma and Ojas. If you leave this room having even something of an understanding of these concepts, I will be super happy. And I'll feel that you're leaving here with like something that can be very practical starting now. And, and that is the idea that all of us have inside of us something called Agni. Agni means fire. Fire is everywhere. The sun is on fire right now, and we're very happy about that. And if that fire decided to go out, none of us would be able to live here anymore. So the Vedic people understood that all of nature relied on fire to live. You and I rely on fire to do everything. All processes happening in the world right now are governed by fire in some form or fashion. Similarly, in your body, you have a fire and it's everywhere, it's in every cell in the body, but it primarily lives here in your belly. And we could speak about fire on every level, mental fire, emotional fire, digestive fire, tissue fire, fire is everywhere. But it's primarily located in the navel because this is where all your organs of fire live. So your liver, your spleen, your kidneys, your in small intestine, your large intestine, it's all right here. Everything important is pretty much right here. Maybe here. And then everything else important is here. But like everything important is here. So this area is Manipura, like the center of fire. We call this fire Agni. For practical reasons as you leave here, you can think about it as metabolism. Agni and the word metabolism are synonyms. You must, according to the teachings, digest everything you eat. But you aren't just eating food through your mouth hole. But you're also eating me right now through your eyes. You're eating the room right now through your skin. You're eating my words through your ears. You're eating everything through the gateways of your five senses. So every single thing you look at on the internet has to be eaten. And then we're like, why am I, why am I weird? Why do I feel this way? Why am I ungrounded? It's like, well, maybe you ate too much internet. <laughs> and you, your, your fire can't catch up with it. Maybe you ate too much news. So everything has to be eaten. Not only that, 
that is why Thanksgiving, I really want to do like a whole thing on just like Ayurveda and Thanksgiving because at Thanksgiving dinner, all that food has to be eaten, but all your karma with your parents has to be eaten. <laughs> you know, all your feelings about why do I suddenly feel like I'm 12? You know, that all has to, why am I being such a bitch? <laughs> that all has to be digested. And then on top of it, we eat gravy and biscuits and, you know, I'm from the South, you are too. So this is a total Ayurvedic um, shitstorm, because we're using that word today. <laughs> because of this principle that everything has to be eaten. Now, what's super cool about this is if Agni, if your fire is balanced, meaning not slow, some of us have slow metabolism. But the flip side of that is some of you have Agni that's too high. And what does that look like? That looks like, and this is going to be what we'll dive into a little bit in the practical realm, too fast metabolism, we have, we're overheated, and food moves through our body too quickly. So you get things like looser stools, heat, etc. Too slow means things aren't moving, and if you've ever been constipated for more than like, for me, like half a day, like it's really hard to function. So metabolism needs to be not too fast and not too slow, but Agni must be balanced. I'm able to take in my life's experiences, understand it, not get stuck in it and not understanding it, not dwelling on it and keeping it, but also not blazing through my life so fast and going to 75 yoga classes and not able to integrate in one of them. I'm not saying that's us. <laughs> So if I don't take time out of my life to meditate, to pray, to lay down on the floor on my bolster, if I don't do that, then I can't process my experience. I can't chew on my life experience. And what the teachings say is all life experience, including food, but everything that occurs to me in life must be chewed on. It's got to be tasted. I got to feel my feelings about that call that I got from my sister or my brother, and I maybe got to cry for about 90 seconds. If I don't do that, I'll get emotionally constipated. And then I might emotionally vomit later. And that's what nobody wants to have. So Agni must be balanced. If you get one thing, my Agni must be balanced. My fire must be balanced physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. We can become too spiritually fiery. The second word is Ama. Ama means toxins. The ancients of thousands of years ago understood toxins better than we do, even though it's now popular to talk about toxins in the yoga world and the wellness world. They understood ama very, very well, and they do a good job at really describing it disgustingly. And ama is said to be like a slime. And depending on how bad it is, it could be like a mucousy experience, or as ama solidifies, it can become hard. Um, it can, ama is a physical thing. In our gut, some say we, the average American holds 13 to 25 pounds of undigested fecal matter. Actual yoga, I hope you're videoing. This is for your promo video next year. <laughs> we hold 25 pounds of undigested fecal matter. It doesn't look like what you may think it looks like. It looks like a tar. And I've worked with people, and I've worked with myself enough, and I've seen Ama in its varying forms, and it can be black. And it smells terrible. Uh -huh. And it's lodged into our bodies, and your body loves you so, 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 so much that it'll keep pushing this Ama deeper and deeper into your tissues so that it won't touch things that are vital. It will hide this stuff in your body, in pockets, so that it will do its best to keep it from touching important things. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing, but it's also challenging because then when you try to get rid of it, you have to dig for it. This is the basis of all Ayurvedic panchakarma or cleansing therapies, is this idea that that toxic stuff is not going to come out easily. Your body, in order to detoxify itself, must be in the parasympathetic nervous system, meaning warm, wet, loving, slow. 
it can't and will not release toxins unless you are very, 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 very calm. Because your body's doing all it can to keep that stuff hidden in you. Ama is not only physical toxins, which it is, it's also psycho emotional toxins. <laughs> and there, we do a whole year program on how to, to learn about this and know how to get rid of it. But the short version is most of the time I have to feel things in order for them to release out of me. And I'm holding all my stories and pictures that didn't get digested in the moment from when I was very, very young, and maybe I didn't have the tools to digest them. And if you believe in past lives, there's every life that you've ever had where you didn't fully digest your experience. And that's stored and held in the physicality of the body. So when you truly do these sorts of practices of detoxification, it's also an emotional, psychological, memory-based release. So the teachings say, the Agni, the fire of life, needs to be balanced in us. The Ama needs to be as low as possible. So balance Agni. So when you leave here, you're going to balance Agni, reduce Ama. Balance Agni, reduce Ama. It doesn't matter what your dosha. Balance Agni, reduce Ama. This third word. And then we get to the fun part of the class where it seems that I brought some treats for us to try. <coughs> so this third realm is you want to balance, what do you want to do? Balance our And we're going to get to increase something finally. Increase ojas. Ojas is a really fun word to say. You can say it if you want. <laughs> and then they do ojas, ojas. It's like, oh. Uh, and it's because that's what it means to be mm, ojas. Ojas is, the teachings say you have eight drops of a mystical, endogenous bliss power. That's why we do drugs. <laughs> I mean, I don't do drugs because I, I did drugs one time and God said, nope. <laughs> you don't need that. And, but the reason that we do anything, right, the reason that we do anything is because we are attempting to change our brain chemistry so we can experience bliss. The reason we do it anything. We're trying to touch that nectar that is ojas. Little babies have this, you know, I have a two-year-old nephew, and, and, and they have so much of this just naturally. He just cracking himself up all the time mm -hmm. over nothing. And let me tell you, he's stoned out of his mind. <laughs> Those chemicals are just firing, firing, firing. We, we are wired to experience bliss with one another. E even when we don't have ama, by the way, this is crazy. When we don't have ama, toxins, even our pain is blissful. When, when there's not toxicity, everything becomes it's ojas. So ojas is the psycho physiological, immunity, virility, fecundity, it's so fun to say that one, your, your juicy sex power. It is sexual in nature because it is creativity itself. It is the part of me that's responsible for me desiring and wanting to create and expand. And in order to do that, I need substance. That's why in Ayurvedic medicine, when we want to help people get pregnant, we give them a cleanse, first of all. And secondly, we build them, and we boost them, and we juicify them, and we give them all these fun little tasks to do together if they're a couple that increase this sweet, vital, sexual power that has nothing to do with penises and vaginas. It's you. It's your life essence. Every cell in your body is literally just making love to itself, right? We, we, by nature, are reproducing ourselves until about 30-ish. And you know what I mean, some of you? And you're like, woo, something changed, right? And so ojas is the goal of keeping your vital youth sap 
is the word. Uh, juicy for as long as possible. So we're going to build ojas, reduce ama, and balance agni. When agni functions well, it can digest your toxicity and it can digest your life's experiences. So it makes a virtuous cycle. As my fire is lit, I can digest my emotional reality, I can digest my mom and dad, I can digest if I have a partner, you know, I can digest my experience, I can digest food. This is why I'm worried about the yoga world because we have the worst digestion of anybody. We're like sensitive little unicorns. It's, it should be the opposite. If we're doing Ayurveda, the teachings say that Ayurveda should be able to digest rocks. That's another workshop. Don't try that at home. Don't try that at home. So this creates a virtuous cycle. When my Agni is balanced, I can digest stuff, whatever that is. Here's the vicious cycle. When I have a lot of toxicity, the t well, let's start here. When my Agni is low, when my gut metabolism is low, I, I can eat the most healthy yoga food in the world. And if I can't digest it, even the best organic blueberries or green sage, whatever restaurant, you know, that is going to turn into toxicity. That's why the teachings say, it's better for you, I'll give you the American version, it's better for you to eat a Big Mac with good agni and a loving heart than to eat organic kale chips <laughs> with a bitchy attitude and bad agni. And I can make fun of that because I have been that girl. <laughs> Right? So the, the virtuous cycle turns to a vicious cycle. Now, I don't have the fire to digest my life or my food, and that in turn creates ama. And then what happens? Ama is toxic green, yellow, brown, black slime, and if your digestive system is a bonfire, you're literally pouring mucus on a fire. And so now you've got a vicious cycle because then that ama puts agni even lower. And now the low agni can't digest the food, and so it creates more ama, and you get into this vicious cycle. So how do I get out of this vicious cycle? Well, I mean, again, I'm not just trying to sell my books or programs. It's complex. There's a whole 5,000-year-old tradition available to you that teaches you how to basically reduce ama and increase or build ojas and balance agni. But the quick on it is, begin to shift your life pattern to a way that's more in alignment with light. Meaning the sun. Wake with the sun. Go to bed with the sun. When the digestive fire is highest in the body, it's when the sun is highest in the sky, they mirror one another. Americans, we do the opposite. We eat our heaviest meal at night when the sun is the lowest. So Americans, on a large, are suffering from chronic low uh, um, agni, high ama, and we, we have the, this epidemic that we have today with health. All disease begins, according to Ayurveda, in two places, the digestive system and the mind. All disease. And then it you know, flowers from there. So um, we have a mailing list, and I actually have a, a little mini class on this that I'm going to send you guys if you get on our mailing list. It's like an hour-long thing about building ojas, reducing ama, and, and building agni. Um, so there are mil millions of ways, but I do recommend just taking time out of your life to do some kind of, hopefully, Ayurvedic, because the other ones I can't recommend, but some kind of Ayurvedic cleanse. You know, taking time out of your life to cleanse ourselves from media is as important as the food that we eat. And so for me, like I have to actually literally sit down and look at the calendar five months out or a year even out and say, in Ayurveda we do these cleanses in the fall and the spring, because that's when your body's naturally cleansing. And so I, I look at my calendar and I say, this week or two weeks even is when I'm doing this health care maintenance. The teachings say the number one way to build the ojas and is to reduce the things in your life that, dis that disturb your mind. 
so psychically, where am I getting hooked? Ojas, building ojas. Have sex with someone that worships you, that respects you, that sees you, that adores you. Make love, enter into an energetic exchange, be it sex or just love, right? Clothing on with someone who loves you and sees you and respects you. And that, especially for women, is the number one way to build a trust. You may be thinking, wait a minute. How do I get that? From a tantric perspective, I can only attract that which I've done inside myself. So Ojas is the ultimate self-love practice. How much do I worship, adore, respect, and see myself in all my many faces? Going back to the story of Shiva, Shakti is Beyonce and she's looking super hot that day and doing an amazing dance, but, and Shiva falls in love. It's very easy to love Beyonce up on stage. And Shiva bows at her feet. I've forgotten all myself for you. I want to worship you. I want to adore you. And Beyonce, Shakti, let's, we'll leave Beyonce for now. Shakti says the most incredible thing that the, a woman has ever said, in my opinion, to a man. And she says to him, you don't love me yet. And he's like, what are you talking about? I've forsaken my entire reality for you. I've forgotten myself into you. I have merged into you, and I give you my whole heart. And she's like, you're, you're not there yet. You don't love me yet. And he says, why? And she says, because you haven't seen all of me. You haven't seen all of my faces. And he was like, well, show me. <laughs> give it up. Let's see it. And, you know, the story goes, like, there's, like, 25 pages of her testing him, right? And finally, she takes off this mask of beauty, this mask of politeness, this mask of sexuality, this mask of youth, and she shows up as the fiercest form of Kali, which is called Chamunda. And this, in the iconography, she's totally dark. Her bones are showing through her skin. Her breasts, once plump, are hanging down to here. She's a 95-year-old woman. She's diseased. She's haggard. And she's angry. So she, ah, you see these, her tongue's out. It's dripping in blood. She's literally wearing, um, this, is a, this, is, this is the way the Indian girl did. If y'all can't handle it, don't study Tantra. Like, She's literally wearing a, a garland of baby skulls. And her skirt is made of human arms. So it's like death. It's like the part of, and by the way, everybody in this story is you. You are Shiva, you are Shakti, you are Chamunda. And she shows up. And this in relationship to one another is when my dude or my girl, my beloved, my mom, my friends, my students, they've seen it. When I show up with another face other than the one right here, this is Lush. <laughs> she doesn't look like this uh, sometimes. And she shows up angry, and she shows up scared, and she shows up old and haggard and diseased. And he looks at her and he opens his arms and weeps. Come here. You are beautiful. I see you. I want you. And he kisses her and then of course she can turn into whoever, right? And now he's got his hot babe back. But the point is, we are those people in this story. This is my ability to be both that thing which is just one face, and the part of me that is scared and feels alone and is afraid of dying and losing her youth and wonders if she'll be covered in cats. And <laughs> that is how we build ojas. The 
there's like 500 things I want to share with you guys right now, but I want to pause my mouth and see if you have, so here we'll do a little Q&A. And then the other thing that builds out just that, that I wanted to leave you with is a practice. So when you leave, you can have something to, to turn into and tune into. And that is the, the, the process of not only building OJAS, but increasing our digestive meta metabolic life power and increasing or rather reducing our AMA is a practice that purifies the gateway of our five senses, our mouth, our nose. We're going to do that practice before we leave. And um, I also brought some OJAS building herbs. So herbology is a big part of Ayurvedic medicine. Um, I brought my favorite things, which um, I work with Ayurvedic and Western herbs. And I brought some Damiana and some Kava. Those are from the Western Pharmacopoeia. And Kava is just a really good Irvine um, tonifier. Um, very relaxing. Uh, I take it sometimes before bed if I'm feeling a little wound up. Helps coat the myelin sheath of the nerves. So any, any herbs that help tonify our nervous system are going to be Ojas builders. Um, so I brought a few of those that I'm going to let us try. Hopefully we'll have time. And then I brought, like, my single most favorite thing in the world, which is my spirit herb, uh, which is rose. And so rose, 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 rose. If you want to speak about ojas, building this language of sensuality and the heart, purifying the heart, the gateways of the senses, rose is the herb, especially in the Western uh, pharmacopoeia. So um, I have a girlfriend in Charlottesville that on, on one moon each year uh, called the pink moon, she harvests um, organic rose petals from her garden. And then she processes them in this, I swear to God, um, rose quartz crystal processing method. Um, and there, she meditates on them. And so each year she makes about 100 bottles. And I was able, through being very aggressive, um, <laughs> to get 100. Uh, no, sorry, 35. <laughs> I hired 100. I got 35 of these bottles, and I have some of them left. So we'll, I'll let us all try it. And even just having a little bit today um, of the rose will be wonderful for all of us. So um, before we do that practice on the senses, do you guys have any questions on this? Huge topic that requires years and years and years to even begin to, to digest. If you were to explain, you know, it's really complex, but to somebody that has never heard of a bishop, mm -hmm. if you were to explain very quickly what, what Kappa uh, by Sure, it's a good question. That's fair. Pitta, I'll start with, is the force of metabolism and heat and transformation in the body. When functioning well, we call it, and I wrote this up on the board, we call it tejas. The light and resplendency of our personality, the heat that emanates from someone's body. When you see someone and they look like they're glowing, it's tejas, it's the fire. From an imbalanced perspective, it's inflammation. So that's, that's the Western word. We, we hear this a lot in our world, inflammation is pitta. It's the, the um, function of transformation and metabolism. Like if I were going to give it one sentence. Vata is the function of anything that's moving in your body mind. So it's the function of degeneration and movement and change. really great ideas and then tomorrow you have a different really great idea and then the next day you have a different really great idea Vata is the force of the great ideas changeability Kapha is the force of sustainability and so whereas Pitta was metabolic um, Vata is catabolic I think I'm getting this right. And, and uh, kapha is anabolic, meaning substance generation, creativity, creation. And when this is functioning well, we do call it ojas. So all these things relate. But 
Um, I mean, I, I'm holding back because there's so much to say, but, but if I were to give like a one sentence thing for those three, that's what it would be. And so some of us are just gonna have more of one or two of, or rare people have all three. That's what I was gonna ask, is because all the tests that I've done say that it's all three in almost equal percentages. Is that possible? Yes. She said it was a lot. I'm sorry, all the tests that I've taken show that it's from all three in almost equal percentages. Yeah. And I don't know, like when you start to read stuff, I'm like, well, I don't know. Right, and that's why I'm not a big fan of them. And, and so there are people who are very much one. There are people that are very much two. There are people that are all three, and those people are very rare. But that does exist, and what that means, and that very well could be you. I don't know. But what that means is that you will have all the superpowers of the doshas, but all of the imbalances prob probably as well. The, the, re the thing that I want you guys to think about when you leave here is um, don't worry about what you are. Worry about what's up now. Just like a doctor. If you go to the doctor, you're not going to be like, you know, let me tell you everything that's right. Because A, he only gives you 10 minutes these days, and, and B, he's very expensive. And so what you're going to say is, here's the problem. And so when you address the problem and you fix the problem, the original nature will actually reveal. Most of us are so imbalanced that we can't even know our original nature because it's been so covered up. Right, and so that's what I'd say. Just don't worry about it, and but learn about it, and learn about the nature of the imbalance. Truthfully, you don't even know, need to know the nature of your imbalance. If you work to build, which is kind of why I decided to do this easy thing, because it's everybody. If you balance your metabolism, get your digestive fire going, which for most of us it's low. Um, Reduce the psychological and emotional toxins in your life. Get your digestion metabolism strong. Cut out all the junk in your food and cleanse your body. If you, if you get on our mailing list, we will give you all the stuff. Like my, I have a school called the Shakti School, the Shakti School, and we give you all this stuff. So like, it's not hard to find people. It doesn't have to be me, but we're, we're pretty good. Like, who can teach you how to do this? But if you do those two things, your, your ojas will be good and your original nature will emerge. Yeah. Just to expand on what you just said, the jumping down, how to explain this. Yeah. Um, you said the imbalance for our body would be anxiety. Okay, so like, yeah, in the mental emotional realm, the hallmarks. So like, <clears throat> pitta inflammation, vata degeneration, kapha lethargy, stuckness. Like, we're just gonna do like the simple down and dirty, fast and dirty. In the realm of the mind, vata, spaciness, anxiety that's based on like fear, grief, deeply held grief is vata, pitta, anger, intensity, criticism of other people, but more often ourselves. Type A people, I, I have a to-do list, and if I don't burn through this, somebody is going to get in trouble. Anybody in the room have a to-do list? Yes. Hyper, hyper focused, but like that can go out of balance. And then kapha is like heavy, lethargy, weepy, depression, but it's, it's so anybody can be depressed, right? But the three doshas will express it differently. Anybody can be sad, but the three doshas will express it differently. You know, like a pitta person who's afraid to start yelling at everybody and like being really mean. Um, a vata will be like, I'm so scared and anxious, whereas a coffee person will just start crying and hide in the room covered in teddy bears and cheese, you know, like, <laughs> it, everybody can experience these things, everybody experiences them through the gateway of the dosha. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but like the, the hallmark, the telltale of a kapha is just like, I'm stuck. Mud. Kapha people. That's why people who have more kapha that are my students, Run outside, run through the woods, do crazy yoga, like dry brush your skin, like have tons of sex often and fast. Like they can get away with it. Whereas like people like me, it's like, maybe you wanna not jump rope for 20 minutes and just like get on a bolster, and, you know what I mean? And so depending on um, your nature, that's why I wrote a whole book about it. Every lens will shift. 
Vata people should do different things than copper people. So why don't we do this? Since we've got about um, 20 minutes left, that's perfect. Let's, you guys that are back there, let's gather around here and let's do a little practice for the senses. So we can, so what, what happens is with these lectures, now I've been speaking for an hour and we'll sit down on the ground um, if you can. You guys have to digest all that information that I just spit out at you. So if, if you, yeah, 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 yeah. I can totally sit if you want to be in the chair. So if, if, if we don't do this practice and we just keep talking and asking questions, you will actually leave less intelligent than you came in. You may feel even slightly overwhelmed. And so now we'll kind of seat it in the body. Um, and I want to give it, I want to drug us up a little bit. So um, I'm going to let you guys try some of these. Okay. Do I, what do I want? Um, so and you're welcome to not, not try any of these as well, but none of these are super strong. These are all very, um, these don't have a lot of counterindications. Uh, what they do is, A, bring a, a little bit of tonifying to the nervous system. So what does that mean? It means that if you're, if you're too, it'll, but if you're too, it'll, the adaptogen quality. <laughs> so kava is really great for stress relief. Um, this is one that is made with a little bit of a chai spice. These, these are based in alcohol. So if you don't take alcohol, you can feel free to pass. Another way to experience the herb is just, if you want, you can just place a little drop in your hand. And um, you know, since we're a community sharing, please don't suck on this tube. Um, <laughs> put a little bit in your hand or you can drop it into your mouth. Um, and you don't need a lot, but if you want to experience the plant and you don't want to take it into your mouth, then um, you can always just put a little bit on your skin and smell it. Um, so I'll pass <coughs> that one around. And mm, this is kava. And they're in just a little bit of different alcohol, so you're welcome to try those. I'll pass this one this way. This one is really fun. This one's called Damiana. Damiana is an herb that has been used in traditional um, Western magic practice for what's known as, I don't know if you guys are familiar with sex magic. This is Asheville, after all. Um, so, you know, all herbs, many, many, many herbs are magical. Um, but Damiana was a, a one that was often used because of its circulatory properties. And so it physically brings blood to the surface. So, you know, you can maybe think why that would be interesting. Um, <laughs> but Damiana is something that I actually take when I'm not in like a sex mode. It's more entering into the realm, all of these herbs, entering into the realm of the sensual, right? And the way that I become a very sexy person is, has nothing to do with anyone else. It's my purification of and my engagement with the gateways of the senses. And so what Damiana does is just it wakes up the sensory realm a little bit. And so this is one of my faves. Um, you're welcome to pass that one around. And again, don't be greedy, not because I don't want to share them, but you don't need a lot, to, act, to especially if you're sensitive. Should we try all of these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So we're going to be like calm Beyonce. You're going to be <laughs> My goal is to create a world of calm, wealthy, sexy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, there's a Mexican cordial called Damiana that I love. We should draw that and add some. Okay, so this is the piece de resistance. This is the reason for this moment. This special rose, um, as I explained, really great for opening the heart. Um, I take it a, a little bit sometimes before meditation, and I would just suggest even just smelling it and experiencing it, and she even has some little rose around it. So we'll just use these herbs very lovingly in small amounts to enhance the experience of meditation. Okay. <laughs> So um, what we'll do is we'll continue to pass them around, and so we'll do it from meditation. So if you feel the bottle, maybe someone just nudging you with the bottle, 
uh, you can take it, but we'll enter into the practice. So find a comfortable seat. And just begin to notice, you know, if you're, even if you're very tired, you can lay down and do this practice, but just begin to notice the energetic landscape of your body. And begin to come into an awareness of your tongue. Maybe feeling some feelings now that it's had a little dose of something delicious. And notice where the position of your tongue is in your mouth. When we are in loving ojas, when we're in our sacred, sensual, sexual power, when we're in the parasympathetic nervous system of rest and digest and connection with one another, our sexuality, the tongue rises to the top of the mouth and slightly points back. And so what I'd like for you to do is don't force that. Your body doesn't like to be forced. Simply bring the tongue to the middle of your mouth. And I like to take a tiny little bite of the tip of my tongue, loving little sweet bite. And what that's going to do is activate the nerve endings at the tip of your tongue. And then bring the tongue back to the mouth, middle of the mouth. And I want you to draw a rose colored line. from the tip of the tongue to the roof of your mouth. And just live there for a few minutes. The tip of my tongue to the roof of my mouth. Tip of the tongue, rose colored line, roof of the mouth. And as you give the brain information about the tongue and the mouth, you might sense that the tongue just naturally wants to go there. So let the tongue go naturally where it wants to go when you give it that information. Tantra tradition, we pray prayers over the body as a temple for God. We enter into a relationship with not just the etheric spirit, but the actual physicality. And so let's take a moment to just bless the tongue. Traditionally, it might go something like, Oh, great tongue, you who are the home of Kama, my longing. Please, bless this mouth. Bless this taste. Purify me of any ways I've misused speech, taste, food, sexuality. Let my mouth take in things that bring out the highest love. And remove from me anything that I'm carrying in this tongue, in this gateway of God. Since, as you witness the tongue that point to the roof of the mouth, you can bless or pray purification over the tongue in whatever way feels right for you. If you don't like the prayer, you can just simply meditate on the tongue and it will still work. And 
feel as you focus on your tongue and your mouth. You may sense the nerve endings starting to light up. You may feel some tingling. We are physically waking up the sensory nervous system, making us more available for pleasure and pain. Now feel your awareness draw down to your collarbones. And again, just like we did with the tongue, if you want to just give yourself a light touch at the collarbone, if that helps you locate them, the feeling of them. And feel two strings, rose-colored cords of light that draw up from the collarbones through your throat, the tube of your neck, and out through your ear holes. Just feel that. This is not an imaginary experience. We are connecting to the anatomy of the body. And so since from my collarbones, I can rise my attention up through the throat and like a string, it's going to pull that awareness out through the holes of my ears into the walls beside me and just continue that rose colored light up through the throat, out through the ears. And as you do this, can you sense your sense of hearing? Noticing the sounds, the more obvious sounds and the more subtle sounds in the room. Be with, for just about two minutes, this line to the ears and the sense of hearing. Pray this prayer, O oh, ears, all day long, just hearing everything around me, I ask that you be healed and purified by this prayer. May I listen to sounds that are sweet, that uplift me. May I hear things that are good for my heart. May I take in through the sacred gateway of the ears, only goodness. And may anything in me that I've heard in my past that I am carrying that does not serve my purpose, that could it just be please released. And just pray the prayer over the gateway of your ears. And you may even feel your ears awakening the nerve endings. feel the surface of your skin. For many of us, the arms are a nice place. They have a lot of nerve endings. The face, anywhere you feel the skin, you can touch yourself. The skin is the boundary. And just like a cell membrane, the cell membrane is not hard and it's not cruel. It is not a wall, but it is permeable. The cell membrane of the skin knows what to let in that is helpful and knows what to keep out unless it doesn't and sense into the surface of the skin we pray this prayer as we feel this gentle breeze touching this gateway of touch may anything in me that needs to be healed at the layer of skin be healed and nourished today through this meditation through being with skin. May I be touched by people that honor me, love me, hold me, see me. And may I touch others with the gateway of my heart. Let this sacred sense realm of touch be, be nurtured. And you can pray that prayer in whatever way feels right as you meditate on the sensation of your skin. If 
your mind wanders to thinking, just know that you've left the gateway of skin and just gently bring yourself back. Now gently let your awareness drift to the nose holes, your nostrils. Let all of you focus at the nostrils, the circular openings and scents that just below the nostrils, as you feel the breath breathing in, you'll sense a temperature change, and you'll take in some smell. And as you breathe out, you'll sense the air move out through the gateway of the nostrils and meditate there, just sensing in. If you could draw two rose-colored lines around the nostrils themselves. We take in so much of our ancient memory through smell. It's our oldest sense. Oh, great gateway, sense of smell. May you be healed and purified. May I take in pleasing aroma. May I make the world a place where the things I breathe in are healthy for me and others. Let the gateway of the nostrils be awakened and purified in whatever way feels appropriate for you. mind wanders, bring it back to the nose, specifically the nostrils. And lastly, the eyes, you can keep them closed for this, bring your awareness to the eyeballs. Rose colored light, points of light like a star Feel the upper eyelids healed and purified. Lower eyelids. Outer corners of the eyes and the inner corners of the eyes. And you can visualize that on each eye on the upper eyelids and on the inner and outer corners of the eye, four little crystal points of light, rose-colored light. Keep your attention focused there. See those, feel those, imagine those. We pray this prayer. May the gateway of the eyes, the realm of my seeing sense, be purified and healed by this meditation. And if you pray that with love, it will heal your eyes. Gateway of my eyes. Anything that I've seen taken in through the gateways of my eyes. May it all be digested. May I extract the nutrition. May I look at things that uplift me and others.